Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this afternoon's, web afternoon's webinar which is Using Administrative Data with Understand Society for Education Research. Now today is a joint webinar, so it's myself, Deborah from the UK Data Service and I have Bigita Rabi with me from the Institute for Social and Economic Research. So we're going to be presenting this webinar between us. Okay, so let's crack on with the webinar. So this is an overview of what we're going to cover. As you can see, there's quite a lot there. So we're going to have a look, first of all, generally at education in social surveys. I'll talk very briefly about how you can search for data on education. And then I'm going to hand over to Begita, and she's going to introduce you to the UK Household Longitudinal Study, or Understand Society, as you may know it as. Once she's introduced you to all the fantastic content relating to education, then we'll switch back to me and I'll talk to you briefly about accessing the data should you want to go ahead and use it in your work. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have time at the end just to show you some ways you can get in touch with us if you need further help, and we'll try and get through any questions that you might have today. So, in general, education in social research, it's a really important area of research. And educational background is recognised as being a highly important factor in shaping individuals' lives and their future outcomes. Now, in many studies, education variables might be used as a predictor for a specific dependent variable, although they're also widely used as the main variable of interest depending on what the research study is focused on. And education-related variables might include something like highest qualification, age left full-time education, what institution they attended, and so forth. And this is just a very brief list of the many variables that are available. One thing that um, education variables can be used at, so they can be used as a direct measure of educational attainment, but they're also widely used as proxy measures for ideas such as economic or occupational opportunity. You can see some examples of previous research, and I'll show you where to find those a little bit later on, just in case you need any inspiration. Now, if you're not familiar with the UK Data Service already, we are a single point of access to a whole host of different social science data. And that can include international macro data. So if you want to have a look at comparing um, different countries, we have things such as the OECD education statistics, for example. We've also got individual and aggregate level census data. We've got some cross-national studies. And we have many thousands of micro-level data surveys from the UK. And these include cross-sectional, panel, and cohort studies. If you're just starting out and you're not really quite sure what your exact research question will be, but you want to start to explore education data, you can start by looking at the Data by Theme page, which you can see on your screen. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got a, different, uh, a number of different themes available. And if you click on the, the one of interest, such as education, you'll see a number of different tabs. And that's just really a shortcut, if you like, to take you to some of the key data sources. It will take you to our search engines. But also, if you look at the research tab, it will show you some examples of existing research. And as I say, that's quite a good place to get some inspiration. There's also a fourth tab, which is resources. And this will include some useful links to external websites and resources which might come in handy. So it's also worth having a look there. You can also use our Discover search tools. So all you would need to do is type in some keywords here, and then you can use the options on the left-hand side of the screen just to refine and narrow down your search. And you can do that on a survey level, but you can also use the variable and question bank to um, search for specific questions. And sometimes if you're looking at a very specific topic, that can be the better option. If you want any more help on how to search for data, then we have a webinar in the first week of May, which will look specifically at some really good tips for searching for data. 
Okay, so let's get on to the really interesting stuff. So I'm going to hand over now to Begita, who is going to introduce both the survey itself and more specifically the education data. Hello, so now it's over to me. Um, I'm Birgitta, as Deborah just said, from, from ISA. We, are, um, we lead the Understanding Society study from a scientific point of view, and I will talk to you about the education content on Understanding Society and then further how, it's, uh, how it can be used with linked administrative data. So um, starting off with a very quick introduction, what is Understanding Society? It's also known as the UK Household Longitudinal Study, UKHLS, and it is essentially a longitudinal household panel survey of all ages, so it covers uh, from babies to very old people, and it is designed to track and analyze change at individual and household level. It started fairly recently in, in the year 2009-10 with a sample of around 30,000 UK households, making it the largest panel survey in the world. And apart from the general population sample, it includes some, some special subsamples as well, which are the ethnic minority boost sample, which includes um, a special sample of the five main ethnic minority groups of the UK. It includes an innovation panel for methodological research. It also includes the British Household Panel Study, which many of you may know. It is essentially the predecessor of Understanding Society and ran from 1991 to uh, 2008, and the whole sample has been included in Understanding Society. And um, of late, in 2015, we added another sample, which is the Immigrant and Ethnic Minority Boost Sample. So in total, we now have around 40,000 households um, in which we have 100,000 individuals approximately, of whom 60,000 are adults and 6,000 are, are youths who we um, interview separately. So the household panel design, I'd like to go into it a little bit more here. Um, as I said, Understanding Society is a longitudinal sample of individuals representing the whole UK population, and they are interviewed within a household context. And specifically, this means that we started off selecting randomly a bunch of addresses, and if at any one address there were more dwellings, then we would uh, select dwellings within those addresses, and then households within those dwellings. And then we go on and collect information about all the residents at the selected household. And subsequently, we follow the sample members' life courses over time, collecting data also from people living with them. So if you have um, a young person growing up in a household, you observe him or her over time. She leaves um, the house, forms her own family, then the new members, her new spouse, will be part of Understanding Society as well, and so on over the life course. So the basic design of Understanding Society is similar to the British Household Panel Survey and other household panels uh, studies in other countries like the German Socioeconomic Panel, for example. In terms of the data collection, we have 12-month intervals between interviews, and we have uh, waves of continuous field work, work that span 24 months so that some people can still be interviewed in their first wave of, of um, understanding society, while you have other people who are already on to their next wave. So these waves are overlapping. And the main sources of information we collect are from adults in households. So everyone 60, aged 16 and older is considered an adult. So we collect information from these people at the household and individual level, and also through proxy questionnaires should one adult not uh, be available for interview. But uh, quite a special component of understanding society is that we also directly interview children aged 10 to 15 through the so-called youth questionnaire. And furthermore, there is information available from interviewers and also um, data which is created through the process of the interview. Understanding society has um, key topics, and those are um, the main significant research domains that we cover. These include employment, family and household, health, health behaviors and well-being, 
income, wealth, expenditure and consumption, and as the fifth key topic, education, which is of interest to the webinar today. So um, going a bit further into um, the education content and understanding society now. What I'm showing you here in this table is um, an overview of the information that we collect in the survey itself. And we show the information on the left-hand side. And then you can also have a look at the waves in which it was collected. And finally, the sources and the file name for that information if you want to go back and actually have a look at those variables in more detail. So um, starting off with the education information we have on adults, um, we have the highest level of education attained by each adult. And this is updated every year because you might think of an adult uh, taking part in further education courses, perhaps gaining a new qualification. So you need to update this over time. And there are derived variables available, which include all the sources of information collected over the, pan over the waves. And this is as um, on entry into the panel and then updated each year. Furthermore, and quite interestingly, we also have the family background of adult respondents. So what we do have is the highest level of education achieved by each parent of sample members. So even if you have a 60-year-old person, say, in the panel, they will be asked about the qualification levels of their own parents. And finally, on adults, in at wave three, we collected their cognitive function through a through various measures um, using tests of word recall, arithmetic, number series, and verbal fluency, we have quite refined measures of cognitive function collected at wave three. So go next, going on to the data collected in the survey on children and young people, you can see the table is quite full. We have a lot of different things that we cover, starting off at the top with parents' attitudes and behaviors. So what we have here is, for example, helping children with homework, the frequency of uh, spending leisure time together, the relationships with the children, parenting styles and quite a lot of detail, including things that are interesting, such as even shouting out and spanking your children. <laughs> and uh, finally, the aspirations that parents have um, for university. This is just a, a selection of, of the types of data that we collect on attitudes and behaviors. And the modules that collect these are, are carried in, in odd waves, like waves 1, 3, and 5, and then continuing on to wave 7 and so on. Uh, furthermore, we have a little bit of information about this, the school that children go to, reported by the parents. But this is just things, do all the children in the family attend the same school? Is it a private or a state school? But as you will see in a moment, we have a lot more information on schools through other sources. Going on to young people, we have young persons' attitudes to education, and this um, covers both people in the youth panel, so age 10 to 15, but we also ask very similar questions to, to young adults, age 16 to 21, because obviously for this group, they, many of them will still be in education, and similar things apply to them as, as to younger people. And these variables include things like the importance of doing well at school, perceptions of parents' interests in their own education, and labor market and educational aspirations. And there are multiple ways in, in which these things are asked, uh, most of them, most of these modules on, uh, on a two-year rotation. And finally, from the youth questionnaire, we have uh, more on young persons' behaviors. And these are also quite interesting. <clears throat> For example, they cover things like bullying at school, so bullying others and being a victim of bullying, misbehaving at school, playing truant, a lot of information on homework. Are they given homework? How much time do they spend on it? Who helps, helps them? Do they get help at all? Uh, do they attend other types of classes after school, for example, private tutoring, dance lessons, music lessons, all of that sort of thing? And finally, the, the young people also ask whether the parents attend um, the parents' evenings in school. So this basically covers um, the information that we have on the survey itself. And you can see it's, it's a broad array of things that are relevant to education. 
And now apart from the survey content, it's quite um, interesting that we also have the opportunity to exploit linked administrative data through education data linkage. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. So to give you an, an overview of this, there, we, we distinguish two big areas here. One is the school level and one is the individual level. So the school level linkage is all made possible through collecting school identifiers. And this is both for children that are currently still at school, but also for young adults for whom we also might uh, be able to link in information about their schools. And um, it's collected in waves 1, 3, and 5. And for adults, it's only asked once. Um, if they've already left school, you don't want to ask these things over and over again. Now, these identifiers are available through special license access, and Deborah will talk at the end a little bit more about how you can go about getting access to them. And then the second big area is, the, um, is matching in of the National Pupil Database. This National Pupil Database is an admin data set of all pupils in state schools in England, and it covers a lot of information, and I will go in, into much more detail of what it actually covers. But just as an overview, it's, it has information about the background of students, their attainment, absences, and exclusions. The data that we have actually linked to Understanding Society covers um, a number of years from as early back as 1995-96 to um, most recently the year 2012-13. So this is just an overview of this area and I'm going to talk in, in more detail about both of them now. So starting off with, um, with the school uh, link, um, identifiers, administrative linkage at school level, we have collected school names in, um, in the survey from parents, so we're asking the parents what, which uh, give us the name of the school your children attend, and this is for children aged 4 to 15. And the parents give us the school name and we immediately convert those into school codes during the interview using a lookup table. The school names are collected in all the odd waves, so 1, 3, 5, etc. And there may be some reason that um, um, information on school is missing. One of these reasons is that parents might not respond to the question. As I told you, it's only on the two-year rotation, so you don't have the responses in the even waves. And um, in wave three also, there was um, a routing error which, uh, which led to not all eligible parents actually receiving the question they should have received. So I'm going to um, go through some possibilities how to recover the information that you might want to have year on year. The first um, thing to note about the, th the Wave 3 missing information is that there was a question in the survey saying, asking, is your st uh, child still at the same school that they were previously, the same state or the same private school? So using this question, you can infer the school for those children that haven't changed school from their previous response. Um, for school, if you want to know the school children attended in the even waves, you might want to assume that if a child is in a particular school at wave one and at the same school at wave three, you can might uh, think it's plausible to assume they've also been in that same school in the even wave in between. And finally, using the linked National Pupil Database data, you can also recover more school codes because these um, contain school codes. So by combining the two information sources, you will know quite um, in, in a lot of detail where children spent um, their, their years, the schools that they attended. So for young adults, the school name was asked in wave one of everyone born since 1981, and this year um, is related to the information that's available on schools, which doesn't go uh, back further than, 19, than cohorts born in 1981 generally. And in subsequent waves after wave one, it was only asked of new entrants to the survey, so-called rising 16s. If an adult has already left school, the school code refers to the last school attended. So um, the school code data, what uh, you will re receive in your data release is the official code of the school used in official statistics. So um, in England, 
This is the so-called DFE establishment number and the same for Wales. For those of you who have used these things before, it's the Lias tab variable. In Scotland, you will receive the seed number and in Northern Ireland, it's the DE reference number. The nice thing about this is, uh, using the official codes, um, you can merge in official statistics. And a lot of this information is actually freely available on the internet and it gives you a, a wealth of information about the context in which children are schooled. Just to give you a few examples for this, in England uh, you have school performance tables. So you have detailed information over time about the school's academic performance. There's also school level census data which gives you characteristics of the student body, for example. So you can know what proportion of the school was receiving free school meals, what proportion of ethnic minorities do you find in the school, and um, you can imagine that this contextual information can be really interesting for a lot of questions about peer effects and other things. And finally, also very interesting, you, uh, we have, you can merge in Ofsted inspections data. So these are grades awarded by the Office for Standards of, um, in Education on school quality, ranging from outstanding to inadequate. So this is also really interesting. So you can refer the quality of the school to the outcomes the child attains within that school. So I'm just going to give you an example of what you can do with this, um, which we have produced for our education topic guide. And um, there is a link at the bottom of this page, but also under the, the resources that we're going to give you at the end. Um, this looks at access to outstanding schools um, and how this differs by family background. So as I said, the Ofsted grade that schools can receive can range from outstanding to good, requires improvement, and um, finally to inadequate stroke fail. And what this um, graph shows is that we see here the proportion of, in each um, Ofsted grade, the proportion of children by the background of the mother. So what we can see is that children who, whose mother has a degree or higher are quite likely to be in an outstanding school, whereas the two lower education categories, you can see that fewer children are in outstanding schools. And the reverse, if you look at the inadequate adequate schools shown in, in blue bars here, you can see that uh, children whose mother has a degree or higher are much less likely to be in an inadequate school. Actually, um, children from in families where the mother has no formal qualifications are more than twice as likely to be in an inadequate school. So this basically points to the fact that there is quite unequal access to good schools across children from families of different backgrounds. So you can see there's a lot of interesting things that can be done um, just merging in administrative data at the school level and it's fairly straightforward. All you need to do is get the school codes, find some information on the web and off you go. Okay, so next we turn to the individual level linkage. So far we have linked um, data from England, administrative data from England and the, da the, the data is called National Pupil Database. What we have done is that we've con collected consents for education data linkage at wave one from all parents of four to 15 year old children and also from all young adults born since 1981. The consent rates uh, for children were 68% and for young adults they were 78%. And then using those consents we matched um, to the National Pupil Database held at DFE using some linkage variables including names, gender, date of birth and address as linkage variables. And the match rates were 82% for children and 55% for adults. The reason for the lower match rates amongst the adults is that um, the current postcode that we hold on adults is not the one that the children um, that they had when they were visiting school. And in future linkages, we have now also gained permission to use school names, the, the name of the last school attended. So in future, these match rates will be much better. So as I said, the National Pupil Database is a registered database of all pupils in state schools in England. 
It dates back to as early as 1996 for some data items, so um, now spanning a considerable number of years. And uh, most importantly, it contains attainment data as children progress through school. I think it's widely known that English children are amongst the most tested children in the world, and you can see here the different assessments they go through, starting from the early years foundation stage profile at the end of reception year at age five, and then through the different key stages of education, where key stage four is um, the GCSEs at age 16, and then it even goes on to key stage five, where uh, the students take AS and A levels, for example. And um, in this table, you can also see the years, the academic years from which this data was collected in the National Pupil Database. This database, uh, on top of the attainment data, it also includes quite rich information, including uh, pupil background. So there's some information about preschool meal eligibility, ethnic background, and so on, which perhaps once linked to the understanding society will not be that valuable because understanding society has very detailed ethnic um, categories on its own. But quite interesting also are absences and temporary exclusions from school. So you can um, know the, all the reasons and the number of sessions missed through absences and when children were excluded from school because they were naughty, basically. So this is um, all the data contained in the National Pupil Database. Um, what we have done is for each individual that we were able to link to Understanding Society, we have added NPD data not only backwards in time, but sometimes even forwards in time, using all the available uh, year, years of data from 1995 up to the most recent academic year at the time of linkage, which was 2012-13. So just to give you an example how to think about this, I've just come up with two fictional examples. These are not actual survey members. Uh, the first one is about Kate. Her parents gave consent to link her education records in 2010 during wave one, and she was eight at the time. She was successfully merged, and we were able to um, retain, to get her information of, of how she did in school in, in the past at, at age five and seven, but because linkage took place a little bit later than consent collection, in the meantime, she's also done her end of primary school SATS test, and we were also able to add those, as well as her absences in each year of school up to the year 2012-13. And because she is not a naughty child and young children don't tend to be that naughty, she has not been excluded from school yet, so we don't have any information on that for her, and we hope it will stay like that. Our second fictional person is David. He consented to link um, his education records when he was 25, so he had already left school some years ago, but still he was successfully matched, and we have um, data going back to key stage two. This is, again, the SATS result at the end of primary school, and we can follow him up to his A-level results. We do not have information on absences and exclusions for him because those were started later in the National Pupil Database records. So you can see that for different people we will hold different types of information, but over time we will build up a really interesting um, overview of how people move through school in different ways. So the linked NPD and Understanding Society data does not include all the data items that are included in the National Pupil Database, but just about all of them. We have just excluded some items that we thought were really not useful. There are dozens and dozens of variables available for you to use. And I'm just going to uh, talk you through some of them to give some examples. So we, at age five, we have the early years foundation stage profile, including all the subscores for about 2,000 children. We have points attained at key stage one, that's at age seven, in reading, writing, maths, and science for about 2,600 children. We have all the SATS results at the end of primary school for about 6,000 children. We have GCSE grades in more than 30 subjects and a whole load of summary indicators of performance at GCSE level for about 4,000 students. 
Then at um, AS and A level, we have the grades in virtually all the subjects as separate variables in there and summary indicators and a lot more for about 3,000 students. Uh, termly absence rates we have by reason. So was it because you were um, ill? Were you visiting a doctor? Was it an absence because of observance of a faith? Was it an unauthorized absence? All of that we have for 7,800 students. Ex exclusions from school only affect people who have been naughty but they affect more people than perhaps commonly known, and about 900 um, such exclusions um, yeah, have been recorded so far. So um, you can see there is a lot of data available, and I'm going to just spend a little bit of time to talk about what possible things you could do with this linked data at the individual level. So as Deborah said in the introduction, there are different ways to think about these variables. You couldn't think of them as an outcome. So for example, you might want to explore the reasons of absenteeism. Why do young people start becoming truant, for example? You might want to study the impact of family dissolution on school attainment or other disruptions in life. And this is really an ideal thing to study um, with a survey such as Understanding Society because we have a lot of detail about changes in circumstances, also regarding income, employment status, things that happen at the family level. And those might conceivably have an effect on school attainment. Thirdly, you might want to um, investigate how school trajectories are affected by um, by other characteristics such as neighborhood deprivation. Understanding Society makes available geographical identifiers which allow you to merge in information such as indices of multiple deprivation, census data. So all your um, data at local level you can study in conjunction with the outcomes here. Obviously you might also want to use education as a control variable. Very straightforward example is a wage equation. There's always a problem that you need to control for ability. Here you could use attainment as a proxy for ability. Finally, heterogeneity analysis is something else that springs to mind where you want to describe outcomes by um, different levels of attainment. So um, just to give you one example which has been in the media recently, the DW, DWP launched an improving life strategy which um, focuses on workless families and they have actually used the linked data um, for their report and um, th they wanted to see how par parents' worklessness affects, relates to children's likelihood of failing to reach expected attainment levels. So what they've done is to just show for workless families and working families what proportion of children fail to reach the expected levels at key stage 1, 2, and 4. And the result is actually quite striking. You can see that children in workless families, as the headline here shows, are almost twice as likely to fail at all stages of their education. So quite a stark message from, from this. And this is based on the linked data that we provide. So I hope that you see some opportunities uh, for your research in this linked data. And um, my final words will be on the next steps here. We have also collected consent for linkage in at Wave 4 again. And we are actually very close to updating the data linkage. And this will provide you with some more recent academic years that we can cover. And also we have re-asked all our respondents to see whether they might now uh, want to consent to data linkage even if previously they had reasons not to. And in the meantime we have new entrants into the survey and some um, other changes which means that we hope to have a larger group of, of people consenting and then matching because now we will also match on school code not only on the other variables that we used previously. Also this year we are planning and we already have permission to uh, perform education data linkage with Scottish education data where again we can link in information on background of students, on their attainment, absences and exclusions, quite similar to the English case although the data is different and the education system is different. 
And then looking forward for 2018, we have planned to perform education data linkage with Wales. And there are some further data sets that we can link to as well, which are the HESA data, individualized learner records, and early year census. And um, the, the exact timing depends on a number of factors, among others, the, the consent for linking in the early year census, for example, has only been collected in, um, in wave 7, which is still in the wave. So this is something that, um, you know, watch this space for the future. But as time goes by, this data will become richer and richer and will cover um, longer spans of the life. So finally, just to point you to a few useful resources if you want to find out more. We have a, um, a user guide for the linked data, which is actually interesting. It's a very big document listing all the variables that are available, including the sample sizes for each of them. So you can see at one, um, at one view whether you know, sample sizes are, are big enough to do whatever you have in mind. And there are some summary statistics in there as well to help you understand the data better. We also have a topic guide which guides you through the education content of understanding society and also gives more examples of research that can be conducted. And the next two links are just generally to our understanding society documentation and the National Pupil Database also has documentation on the DFE website that you might want to look at. So this is all for me for now and I will hand back over to Deb uh, for the rest. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so hopefully you can see that Understand Society and the Linked Data is really such a fantastic resource if you are interested in education related topics. So we're just going to finish up very quickly with um, a brief overview of, of accessing the data and I'll just talk about the different access conditions that Begita mentioned earlier. So the Understand Society data and the, the linked data as well can be accessed through the UK Data Service. Some of you, if you've already downloaded data, will know that you just pop on to Discover, search for the data or look through the data by theme pages. Once you've found the relevant data set that you're interested in, then you click on the download order icon, which you will see um, to the side of the page. Now, we've already mentioned that different data sets will have different access conditions. Now, those access conditions really reflect the level of detail and sensitivity of the data. So let's have a, a really sort of brief look at what we mean. Some of this you may be familiar with if you've already used data from us. But just briefly, we have the end user license data, so the main Understand Society data set, for example, is available under there. And that's for anyone who is registered with the service. It's very simple, a couple of clicks, and you, you download the data directly to your PC. Now, because there are very few conditions here, the level of detail will be um, not so great here. So for geographical region, for example, you might get government office region, but you won't get any smaller area information. And you, for example, with dates of birth, you will probably just get the year of birth. And that, that's quite standard for all data sets, really, on the individual level. We saw earlier that the school identifiers are available under our special license conditions. Now, again, it's quite simple here. You can download this onto your PC in the same way, but you do have to fill out a special license form, and there are some additional conditions which you must make sure you read um, and accept. And what happens is that you fill out the special license form and uh, submit it. We will pass it over to um, the data owners, and they will just have a look and approve that. And once they've approved that, then we will give you access and, as I say, you download it to your PC. And this will give you information which is a little bit more detailed. So now you can have smaller geographical areas such as local authority and local educational authority, for example. And now you'll get a little bit more detail with dates of birth, for example. So you'll get the month and the year. And you'll get all those school identifiers that Begita mentioned earlier. Now, for the full linked MPD database, that is available just under Secure Access. 
And the reason is because obviously it contains very detailed information, which is obviously personal data. So we have to make sure that we protect the confidentiality of those people's um, school data. So access is limited to those who have applied to be approved researcher and they will have to come along to London for a day, spend it with us and we will um, give them some training on data protection, data security and how to use the data safely. Once access is then um, granted, rather than download the data onto your own PC, access is via our virtual secure lab. So that will be perhaps a, a little bit different way of working, but we, we go through all of that on the SURE training course. And that will give you, as I say, the linked um, MPD database, but it will give you other things such as full dates of birth, national grid references, so you can get much more finer level detail. If you need any more advice about that, then obviously do get in touch with us, and I'll just show you how to get in touch with us um, now. So we have at the UK Data Service our support help desk, and we deal with all sorts of data-related queries. We'll help you find data if you're not sure, how to understand the data or coding frames, etc., and any problems that you think you've identified. And you can email us on support at ukdataservice.ac.uk or you can use the web address at the bottom of the screen. But also Understand Society has their very own user support forum and this is a really, really valuable resource so you can log a query directly with the Understand Society team and that's quite often a useful thing to do if you, your question is very technical or very detailed, for example. You can also search for previous issues that people have raised. So it may be that somebody's asked the same question and you can just do a quick search and find the answer uh, there and then. Um, so they're two really, really good resources if you need some help. Okay, so that comes to the end of the content that we want to cover today. There are obviously other ways to keep in touch, so you can follow us using Twitter and, and Facebook, and that's the same for the Understanding Society team as well. Um, we also have a subscription email service, so we can keep you up to date if you subscribe with any new data releases, etc. Um, so thank you very much, and we wish you all the best with your research.